a reflection of what you would have everyone here. Amen. All right, so we're continuing our sermon series called Revealing True Power. Today is called Hearts and Loaves, and this one is thick. All right, you guys ready? Like it, it's, it, it's, 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 the, it's the deep end of the pool today. So if you'd like to follow along, we're going to be in chapter six. We're going to go over three stories, and they're all kind of talking about the same thing. Uh, it's we have the, the we have the beheading of John the Baptist and Herod. We have the feeding of the five thousand and Jesus walking on water, all right in a row, and they're all kind of talking about the same kind of stuff. And because this. Mark is clever, and I hope to show you some of the cleverness by which he is talking. And my goal is for you to look at these stories in a way that you never look at them before. Either that or think I'm crazy. Either one. Like I'm, I'm going, those are my two goals for today. So, to start it off, we start off with the third story. Jesus sees the disciples. They're straining at the oars. He sent them off and they, they are, the winds have picked up and they're trying to get across the, the sea and, and you, know, you have all this, the dangers of the sea stuff and they're going and, and Jesus stares across them and he, and he goes to walk by them. He, he goes and he steps out onto the water and, and he walks over here and, and you have this. You have Mark chapter 6, verse 48. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Ooh, man. And then it says this. And he meant to pass by them. What? what? Like that's, he meant to pass by them? Like he's just walking and he's like, you know. Hey guys, you know, like, like it's like it's weird, right? Like that's that's a weird thing to that's a weird thing to say. It's an odd thing. This is Mark has a lot of instances of strange Jesus. All right, strange Jesus. This is Jesus being strange here. And as you are reading through the gospel three times before Easter, look for all the instances where Jesus is being strange. And when you see them, make note of them. It's like, why is he being strange here? And to plug something else. In our Job Bible study this last week, we talked about this. Uh, the main commentary I'm using to do all the studying for this really connected it to Job chapter nine and, and over there. So if you'd like the answer to that, you can watch last week's on our YouTube channel, right? And, uh, and all that, and you can join in. You never know what we're gonna talk about, but we're probably gonna talk about Job right now. But, but so, so we talked about that, but it's Jesus kind of being strange. He just goes by them, and the disciples see him. They see him there, and they're, and they're looking, they, and they look right at him, but they don't recognize Jesus. They're like, it's a ghost. We know we're all going to die. Like, it's, 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 it's terrible. It's, it's this strange part in this story, right? And then Jesus does something. He comforts them. He says, do not be afraid. You know, it's I, I'm here for you. Don't, don't be afraid at what is going on. Like, they, the, the disciples are astonished at what happens here as the wind and the waves die back down as he climbs into the boat after he says, do not be afraid. And here's the verse for that. He says, and they were utterly astonished. If you're reading Mark, you should see that word a lot. They're amazed, they're astonished, they're astounded. It's all kind of the same thing. For, and then it says this, and this is the sermon right here. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. What? That's like, so... So I, I'm kind of a lazy reader, you need to understand that, and sometimes when things are so confusing, I don't do anything with them, and like, I remember reading Mark in the past, going, okay, we're reading all this, and you get to this verse, and they didn't under, they were astonished because they didn't understand the loaves, and their hearts were hard, what in the world does that mean? Anyone know? That's weird, isn't it? It's an, it's an odd phrase, but it's obviously important because he's saying like, hey, the disciples were kind of ignorant here because they didn't understand the loaves. Do you understand the loaves? Some of you are like, I haven't had lunch yet and I ate breakfast at like six o'clock and I understand the loaves. <laughs> like, like that's may, may, maybe not, maybe not. May, maybe that's the bad type of thing over there. We'll, 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 get, we'll get into that, right? And their hearts were hard. 
All right, so let's, let's get into this. Let's look in the context of what he's talking about, about the loaves and the hard hearts. Now, one of those things you sh- should be ringing a bell in you already. When you hear that someone's heart is hard, where, where does your mind immediately go? Exodus, Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh, his heart, God hardened his heart, right? That's a, that's a huge one. Like Pharaoh is hard in heart. And isn't it interesting that the first story that we're looking at in this little section is about Herod, this big political ruler, right, that's, that's having all these huge parties. So we, what we have to do is we gotta put on our biblical glasses and see, it's like, why are they mentioning something about hardened hearts that makes my heart kind of think of Exodus a little bit? So when we look back at Herod, Herod's the big, big bad political leader. He's King Herod, he's, he's it, and he is throwing a birthday party. He's got, he's got John the Baptist in the prison and, and like that's, but he doesn't want to kill him because he kind of likes John the Baptist. John the, ba- yeah, John the Baptist gets a little mouthy every now and then talking about his marriage to his brother's wife, but no big deal. We don't judge around here, right? Like, like that, that's, he, he's, he's like, he's over there, but he kind of likes John the Baptist. He's scared of him because it's a little loose cannony, but he likes him, right? So he doesn't, he doesn't want to kill him, but Herod is there, and he has a big birthday party. Now, let's be honest with ourselves. We know what these things are. It even says what it is in the text. What's the purpose of the birthday party? Like, the reason why I have birthday parties is so that I can hear from all of you about how awesome I am, <laughs> all right? It's like, oh, Chris, like you're the best. Like all that stuff. And like we had these big birthday parties. It's not that different from Herod. He's like, it's this, these big displays of, of like power and opulence. And like, look at how amazing everything is. Look how amazing I am. And this is the story that Mark is bringing us into. Because did you notice at the beginning of my reading, this story is out of chronological order. Did you notice that? There's an aside at the beginning of it that it's like, oh man, John the Baptist is back alive? And then it's almost like it's this rewind to a previous time. The gospel writer of Mark has put this story here for a purpose. It's not just, this is what happened on Tuesday, March 17, year one. Like, that's not, that's not, what, it's, that's not what it is. It is saying that this is this, this is thematically important right here, all right? And so he's throwing this huge birthday party. All the people that are important are at this birthday party. They're all there. This is a photograph of that event back in the day. And, and so, so they throw it out there, and, and, then, and then this girl comes out, comes, comes out to dance, you know, in front of all of these elites and all of these people of great means all around Galilee. And it's his wife's daughter that comes out and begins to dance. Hold on. The wife's daughter? How old was she? You know, like, uh, uh, make, maybe you feel a little uncomfortable, right? And she's dancing in front of all these big, powerful men at the birthday party. Like, ew, like gross, right? Getting strong, like Weinstein vibes and, and, and like in men that run like teen pageants and stuff like that. It's just like, ugh, you know, like, like, like ugh, what's going on? Like that. And she, and, and she does such a good job of dancing and it amazes everyone, like everyone amazes it so much, which is also icky when you start thinking about it, right? And, and, and it says this, for when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish. You know what he's doing here. He's looking all big and bad on his birthday party. Like, look at how much power I have. This, this girl pleases us so much, you know, like get, I, I will give it to you, whatever you wish. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give it to you to half of my kingdom. Half of his kingdom. Man, you know this man wants what he wants. Like all those things. And, and, and you know, talk about trying to impress your friends. And this young girl asked her mother. It's like, what should, what should I ask for? 
at which her mother is Herod's wife, which would, that would mean that Herod is her uncle slash stepdad. Uh, all right, all right, all right. Now, 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 and she asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter. Now, we know the answers to this, but let's go over it. Did the king want to kill John the Baptist? No. Who has all the power in, in that region of Galilee at this time? King Herod. Hold on. So he's going to do something now that he doesn't actually want to do? I thought he, Herod has all the power, right? He has everything. He's the king. And yet he's doing something that he doesn't want to do? He, he's it. You see, his power ends at, his power, which should be all over the place in that region, ends at a young girl doing a sexy dance. He's a feckless ruler. He has no power. He's controlled by this young girl's dance. That's really what the true power is here. King Herod, he's not a leader that cares about the people. He's only a leader that's in it for himself. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, we complain about that all the time with everybody, right? Like, like you're in it for yourself, like, like all that stuff. And we look out in the world and we see the lust of power all throughout the political world and it makes us think of this. This is nothing new. This is the bell that, that the gospel writer Mark is ringing. He's like, this isn't just a case here. This is a case throughout all this desires for political power that we find ourselves in. And he's connecting it to that hard heart of Pharaoh. And he's like, don't you remember what it was like when God ripped you out of Pharaoh's grasp and wandered into the wilderness right there, right? Because where do they go next? It's all of a sudden the story about Herod ends. It ends and Jesus comes back with his disciples. His disciples have just gotten back from this little missionary trip and they're like, Jesus, we got so much to tell you. It's so great. We need to go debrief. And they go out into, and I use this word on purpose because Mark doesn't use it, the wilderness. They go out into the wilderness and, and they... And, and they go to debrief. But what happens? A bunch of people follow them out there. All these people follow Jesus into the wilderness. And I don't know if you guys have ever caught this before, but as soon as you read Herod with the notion of Pharaoh and Exodus and all that stuff in it, and all of a sudden Jesus goes out in the wilderness and all these children of God go out into the wilderness too, and then it says this, when they went to shore, they saw the great crowd and Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. There's Exodus overtones all over that. There's not just Exodus overtones. These people are lost right in the in the wilderness not just exodus overtones but there is overtones of that this king this feckless ruler of herod is just he's got no power and these people are just lost because shepherd is like a kingly idea you know david was a shepherd you know like good king david was a shepherd the prophets talk about your shepherds are garbage and all, all that stuff like that's kind of a kingly idea in the old testament and he says that it's like sh they were like sheep without a shepherd that they're just lost and didn't know what to do. And when Jesus saw them, he had compassion on them. Whenever I see someone that's kind of just lost and all that stuff, I don't always have compassion. It's like, what are you bothering me for, right? Like, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? But yet Jesus saw all these people and, and, how, and had compassion. And how do the disciples respond to it? Do they have compassion? No, like you can tell Jesus is like teaching them and doing all that stuff, but the disciples end up being like, Jesus, we need to get these people, like they need to go home. Like we're out in the wilderness here. There's nothing over there. There is no historic God-given precedent for God providing food in the wilderness. There's just none of that. 
Like over there, go, go, go. That's a joke for Bible nerds in the room. So that, that, that's, they, there's no historic precedent for that. Like they need to go home. You're like, you, and, and this is one of my favorite things. They, they, they're like, send them away. Go to the surrounding countryside and the villages and buy themselves something to eat. They can't eat out here, Jesus. Send them out. And Jesus can you imagine being the disciple? Because they're being practical here. They're like, there's, there's like 5,000 people here. Like, we can't feed them all. They, they need to go somewhere else over there. And Jesus is like, they need to eat? You give them something to eat. Like, thanks, Jesus. Like, like, like that's, that's completely unhelpful. Like, that's completely unhelpful, compl- you know, over there. It's this hilarious phrase. You, you give them something to eat. You do it. And... This is the feeding of the 5,000. And, and he goes, well, how much food do we have? And who remembers how much food they had? Five loaves and two fish. All right, when we add that together, what do we get? Seven, right? Yeah, we, we said, I made it easy. Some of you are like, hold on, that wasn't enough. One, two, three, like, like that's, like that, that's, so that there's seven there, seven of days of the creation, right? And, and it's like this reminding us of that creation completeness. And if you read the document, uh, the, the scriptures more, he has them lie, sit down on the green grass of the new creation, right? And they feast on there, and it says something very, very interesting, I think. It says that they ate and were satisfied. These lost people in the wilderness, and Jesus provided compassion and was able to provide manna for them, I mean loaves for them in the wilderness, and, and it was, they were satisfied. They weren't satisfied by that political ruler. How many of them complained incessantly about what Herod was doing, right? They, they turned on the, they, well, let's see, what, they wouldn't call it cable news. They, they, call it, they call it something else. They turn on the radio and the TV and like they read their, they get their stone tablets of news out. Like, can you believe Herod's doing this? Like, like, over, over, like over there, how many of them just felt like sheep without a shepherd and then Jesus satisfies in the midst of the wilderness? See it? Now, remember, God created his people groups, his people, out in the wilderness. He split them up into tribes. How many tribes of peoples did he create in the wilderness? (gasps) How many basketfuls were left over? (laughs) To a 12. Oh my goodness. This is all just a coincidence. There's no, like, there's no reason why we would be talking about some feckless ruler that has a hard heart like Pharaoh and, and then all of a sudden talking about loaves in the wilderness that God is procuring out of nowhere and then 12, it's almost like God created the world in seven perfect days and in the midst of, of scary things and destruction and wilderness, he then creates his people, the 12, right? Cool, huh? And then you see, you know the disciples were tired of this. They're just like, okay, yeah, what, what, you know, like, this is great. Like, this is amazing, Jesus. It really is. But we're tired. Like, we've been on this missionary journey, and we really just want to talk to you. And Jesus is like, fine, fellas, get in the boat and go across the water. Get in the boat Because you see Jesus' compassion in how he deals with everyone. It's not like, all right, everyone, miracle's over. Get out of here. You came, see, you came, like, like the, the offering plates in the back, you know, like, like he, didn't, he didn't say that, right? Like, he ends up dealing with everyone kind of one-on-one in his compassion and as he sends the disciples across the water. And then Jesus goes on a hill to pray, and we're back to the beginning of the, of, of the sermon where he kind of gets up from the prayer and he sees the disciples struggling across, across the waters. The wind is against them. And you have all that whole idea of the evilness of the sea bringing in all around them and forcing in on them. And they, they go over there and then Jesus goes, walks across the water and then he just wants to walk by them, which is super weird. And they look at him and they're like, ah, they look straight at Jesus. It's a ghost. They look straight at Jesus and they didn't recognize him. And look, look at this. Notice, the disciples weren't acting in compassion at all, ever. I have a feeling that's why Jesus, just get in the boat, fellas. Go to the other side. And yet when they're scared and they've lost their faith and all that, look at the compassion that Jesus is still giving them. 
They saw him and were terrified, but immediate, he immediately spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, don't be afraid. Like he deal, and he gets in the boat, he deals with them with compassion, and we get to our verse for the day, and they were utterly astonished at the wind and waves coming down, and they did, for they didn't, and, and Mark says, and I think you can understand it now too, they didn't understand about the loaves, and their hearts were hard. This has hit me hard. This verse is probably one of the reasons why we're doing Mark right now. All right? Like this, they didn't understand about the loaves because their hearts were hard. I think when we, church, forget about the loaves, and what do the loaves mean? It means those times when everything seems to be going against, right? You have fear and insecurities and all that. You have the wilderness, right? And God provides even in those things. God is making loaves out of nothing. He's providing manna out of nothing. He, he's, he's hard. And when we sometimes forget the loaves, we end up bending into worry about just ourselves. And we lose compassion. We lose compassion. And this, and this week, we're really kind of focusing on Herod and Pharaoh and all these things. And oftentimes, and we're going to see more of this coming forward, we put our hope in these political leaders, right? We turn on the news, the old tablets, we read, listen to the podcast, we listen to something, and when we come in there, we begin to fear. It's like, oh no, if that person gets into office, or if this person is this happened, or this person, we end up losing our compassion, and we begin to hate the people around us. Hate may be a strong word. Completely distrust, and, and don't, it's like that person voted for them, I can't handle them. And we lose compassion for them, don't we? How many times have we watched 24-hour news program or we read that one blog that we like to, like to read that's talking about those political candidates and we walked away going, boy, I love my neighbor more. <laughs> right? Yeah. Did we forget about the loaves? Because our hearts were hard. I, I think that's what's going on here that we forgot about the loaves because our hearts were hard. But notice what Jesus does. As we walk through the story of the rest of the Gospel of Mark, and you guys are Christians, you know the story. Systematically, whether it's the political leaders, the religious leaders, and even the disciples himself, that's us. We abandon Jesus. And even in the abandonment all the way to the cross, where the political, finally the final nail in the coffin, or on the cross, I guess you say, done by Pilate, that political leader, he goes to the cross, and when he raises again later, he comes to us in the same compassion as all those people that are wandering in the wilderness. Because I think we all feel that too that we're so frustrated by the political nature of all that's going on us, we're just looking for answers, so we bend into all of these blogs and TV shows and all these things, we bend into all of them, and it just leaves us feeling like we're wandering around the wilderness with nothing. And in that time, Jesus sees us like sheep without a shepherd and looks at us, even though we may not see him, looks at us and goes, it's I, take heart. Don't be afraid. Because he loves you so much. And I think that's what this section is about. About how God has compassion on all of us and loves us. And that that compassion, when we can grab it, it gives us compassion for our neighbors as well. So have peace, everybody. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much and that you are with us. Lord, help us to remember the loaves. Help us to remember how you 
have provided for us day in and day out, Lord. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear how you are are guiding us each and every day. And Lord, help us to see your compassion towards us that we may have compassion for others. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So 